Hi there. Thanks for joining us again. This is Space Nuts, where we talk astronomy and space science. My name is Andrew Dunkley. Coming up on this episode, we'll be looking at, or more to the point, listening in on the Boeing Starliner. Uh, the reports are that strange noises are coming from inside and nobody's in there. So what could it be? We'll also be taking a look at the history of Ganymede. It apparently took a hit by an asteroid that was bigger than the one that killed off the dinosaurs on Earth. Uh, we will be revisiting the story about black hole jets. They think they've figured something out. And uh, believing in aliens. Do you believe in aliens? Well, if you do, you might want to listen in on this story because uh, some are saying this is becoming a problem. This is all coming up on uh, the next edition right now of Space Nuts. 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 10, 9, ignition sequence start. Space Nuts. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Space Nuts. Astronauts report it feels good. And he's back again for more. It is Professor Fred Watson, Astronomer at Large. Hello, Fred. Hello, Andrew. I'm here for more, uh, but I'll give less, just, you know... <laughs> to, be, to be contrary, yeah. Less, less is more, though, Fred, as we yes, know. Indeed. Yes, mm. indeed. I've yeah. heard that saying a few times over the years, and it's not true in golf. So less uh, is not more. Yeah. Unless you're playing a Stableford. Oh, Stableford. A Stableford, which was named after a man named Stableford, believe it or not. Impact. And what is yeah. it? It's uh, where you get points rather than um, you get points for what you score. So... You always score. Um, you get two points for a par, three yeah. for a birdie, four for an eagle, five for an albatross, which no one ever gets. Uh, or you only get one point for a bogey and nothing for anything worse than that. But there are variations of it, but that's the one we play. And so um, less is less. Yes, you're right. Less is less. Yes, exa yeah. exactly right. Or if you hit it less, you get more. <laughs> So it can go that way too. It's a weird game. Uh, it is a strange game, is golf. Golf's a game of opposites. You hit down to get the ball up. You hit left to go right. You swing right to go left. It's, you know, no wonder no one can play the damn game. And when you get to the end and you should feel glum, you feel happy. Yeah, um, that doesn't happen. <laughs> you generally feel glum. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, can we can we talk about the uh, Boeing Starliner because it's in the news at the moment? Uh, I know we're sort of recording a little bit ahead of time, so the story may well have changed by the time this comes out. But uh, the Boeing Starliner, as you know, is kind of stranded, and the astronauts are um, stuck on the International Space Station. From what I've heard, until about February, um, they're trying to figure out how to bring the Starliner back. There's been talk of sending it back empty. Uh, in the meantime, Fred, there's been some weird noises coming from inside. You uh, you obviously heard about this too, because we both thought we should talk about it. <laughs> yeah. Um, I have got uh, a recording that was provided by NASA, uh, which is a conversation between Mission Control and astronaut Butch Wilmore. And I'll let it sort of pan itself out before we discuss what the probable noise is. It's a strange noise coming through the speaker, and I didn't know if you could connect into the Starliner and let me uh, keep mic and let you hear. I don't, I don't know what, what's making it, but uh, I don't know if it's something that maybe connected uh, between here and there, making that happen. But uh, anyway, can you do that? We can configure that, Butch. Give us a minute, and I'll call you back when it's ready. That. All right, Butch, that one came through. It was kind of like a pulsing noise, almost like a... Sonar ping. Yeah, I'll do it one more time and I'll let you scratch your head to see if you can figure out what's going on. Here we go. Yeah, so that was astronaut Butch Wilmore on the International Space Station uh, conveying his concerns or at least uh, asking. NASA to investigate this odd noise coming from inside uh, the Starliner, and they've been trying to figure out what it is. Now, I, I know the answer now, but when I first heard it, I hadn't read the story, 
And my immediate thought was audio feedback. That's exactly what I thought it was. And uh, that's what they believe it might be, a feedback loop. Yeah. Well, yeah. you listen to audio all the time. You've probably been in many studios where there's feedback that you don't want, and it always sounds like that. <laughs> it does. In fact, uh, yeah. when I worked for the ABC, if you didn't push the magic button before you went on air, yep. the satellite fed back ah, through, through, yeah. through all the transmitters. So everybody who was listening would, would got that sound yeah. almost exactly like that. Yeah. So, uh, yes, you got a call very quickly from Master Control in Sydney if you didn't push the orange button. It was the green orange button too because the, it was actually marked orange because that's where the line went from Dubbo to a city called Orange just oh, down the road. Okay. And so they had orange <laughs> written on the button, but the button was green, so we affectionately called it the green orange button. Yeah, well, it would. That's exactly the description. It's the green orange yeah. button. That's right. But, yeah, feedback. Yeah. turns out it was probably feedback in the um, audio systems. Yeah. So. Um, Easily solved, but uh, it must have sounded weird to them, this noise. They probably did worry for a minute. Who's got yeah. into that? You know, is this somebody from outside our vicinity on planet Earth or what? Yeah, it, it? It, sound, it, it, it certainly sounded like someone trying to get in. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it does. Mm. Yeah. Anyway, problem solved. Well, you know, mystery solved. I don't know if they've solved the problem. They haven't, certainly haven't solved the problem of uh, the um, Starliners issues, but um, they're working on it. It um, it will we believe by the time this goes to air, I suspect it will be back on Earth. Um, yeah, because there's we'll serious see. talk of when it when it will come back. So yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, Fred, let's move on. Uh, Ganymede. Uh, this uh, is a, an interesting world. It uh, is uh, well. It it suffered a similar uh, incident to that of Earth. Um, so many million years ago when Earth was struck by an asteroid that basically obliterated um, most of the life on the planet, including the, um, the the end of the end for the dinosaurs. I think they were already in trouble, but this asteroid finished the job. Well, now uh, they've been looking at the history of Ganymede, uh, Jupiter's largest moon, and it looks like it took a similar hit some time ago. In fact, that asteroid was much, much bigger. Yes, it would have to be uh, because uh, the modelling that has been done um, by a group uh, based, uh, if I remember rightly, in Japan, uh, that uh, modelling uh, shows that the whatever it was that hit Jupiter's moon Ganymede was enough to tilt it, uh, mm. to change its axis. And that's big stuff. That's big time stuff. Um, you don't you know, you, you can clout it with something small and it might destroy a biosphere or muck it around like the like the Chicxulub uh, asteroid did that wiped out the dinosaurs. Uh, but uh, to change the way an object rotates, uh, that is really something hefty. And the thinking is that the asteroid that hit Ganymede was probably 20 times the mass of the asteroid that hit our planet and got rid of those naughty dinosaurs uh, mm -hmm. back in the day. So, uh, and it, it, the, the study comes, it, in fact, it's, um, scientists at uh, Kobe University uh, and, and elsewhere, um, what they've done is looked at surface features on Ganymede. And in particular, there are what are usually called furrows. They're probably valleys when you, you know, when you get down to the scale of what they look like. Uh, we call them furrows, uh, and they're concentric circles. They're in. They're not just you know things that traipse across the across the disk of Ganymede. They are centric concentric circles, uh, and their diameters measured in thousands of kilometres. Remember, Ganymede is bigger than the planet Mercury. It's uh, yeah, with diameters um, no, well over five thousand uh, kilometres. Uh, so uh, the uh, the what what these scientists have done is looked at these circles and in particular looked at kind of where the center is, the center of what's called the furrow system. I, th I suppose you think of furrowed brows and things like that, um, but yes. that's what they are. Um, and it turns out that that center is exactly opposite where Jupiter is uh, in the sky of Ganymede, because like most moons, 
next to a big planet, Ganymede is tidally locked in uh, in its dance around the planet Jupiter. Uh, it's tidally locked, so it always faces the same side to Jupiter. This is um, s telling you that the center of the furrow system is directly opposite where Jupiter is in the sky. And this has led the scientists to do modeling as to how that could have occurred. And sure enough, something big has hit it. Uh, only a large impact could have moved the rotational axis of Ganymede in the way that we think it has happened. So, uh, yeah. yeah, really uh, quite significant discovery. Some really very nice planetary geology, if I can call it that, uh, that's gone into this study. Uh, and um, very much uh, a, a, an outcome uh, that uh, we think might change our understanding of Ganymede. Mm. And we're talking about an asteroid that was 300 kilometers in diameter. Something like uh, that. Which is correct, about, yeah. 100, what, about 180 miles in diameter. Yes. Yeah. Would be about, yeah. That's a yep. big rock. It is a big rock, yes. Uh, yeah. We would not, uh, had that hit the Earth, uh, we would have probably had a global extinction of everything uh, because yeah. the effect on the planet's atmosphere and biosphere would have been devastating. And would, and you'd have to say that would be irrecoverable? Life would not have developed at all? Uh, it may have done, It may, but it might have had to start again. <laughs> You know, yeah. Uh, from whatever processes started life, three point eight or thereabouts, million years ago, billion years ago, uh, yeah, you you might be um, going back to square one, um, mm. which is sort of may have happened anyway. Uh, you know, um, in the in the earliest history of the of the planet, because it went through various uh, phases. We talked not very long ago about Snowball Earth, which actually wasn't that long ago, seven hundred million years ago, but in its early history. It probably had all kinds of weird and wonderful phases that it went through. Mm. And how long ago did this happen to Ganymede? Four billion years ago. Something like that. That's correct. Yeah. And that's a time when the, you know, the solar system was pretty wild and woolly. There was still a lot of uh, debris from left over from the formation of the planets, like large asteroids, uh, which were swilling around the solar system. Um, it may even have been that uh, you know Ganymede was only just tethered to the planet Jupiter at that time. It probably may even have been itself uh, a very hot world because uh, four billion years ago, uh, you know the 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 solar system is only four point six or four point seven billion years old. So you're talking about a very early time in the history of our solar system, and things would have been very different from what they are now. Yeah. Um, what would have happened to the asteroid? Would it be absorbed into Ganymede? or Because it made a crater, like a massive crater, 1,600 kilometers or something in diameter. Yes, that's, that's right. Huge. So you, you're absolutely right. Uh, we think that Ganymede is an ice world, that it has a very thick layer of ice, probably you know 150 kilometers thick, much thicker than what we think Enceladus has. But of course, Ganymede is much, much larger, larger than Enceladus or Europa. Um, and uh, underneath that layer of ice, there is an ocean, we think. Uh, we have very good reason for believing that. Uh, and um, that is probably uh, where the debris lies. It's probably been absorbed into the ice crust of Ganymede. Uh, so if we, know, if we got close enough, as it rotates, we could hear a, a rattling, scraping sound. That would be the... <laughs> the asteroid churning around underneath the ice layer. Uh, I suspect it probably got obliterated, but there should be rocky debris from it, you would think, mm. uh, which might well be something that the first time we send a lander to Ganymede that sort of lands among the furrows, which might be quite hazardous actually, but once you do that, you might very well be able to look for evidence of the, uh, you know, the devastation uh, of this asteroid, the part, the bits and pieces that are left over from that um, that cataclysmic impact. I know people are saying, "Ask the question, Andrew. Ask the question." So I'll ask the question: How do we know this happened? How how uh, what, is it just because we we're looking at the surface, going, "Oh, hello, what happened here?" Or is it, or is there something uh, yeah. else in play? No, you, you're right, absolutely right, because I've skirted over that. Uh, 
so the 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 the, the concentric circles are what tell you that there was an impact event. That's you know the the basically the debris or a kind of quasi quasi crater. Uh, uh, but um, it's the uh, it's the the position of this in relation to the direction to Jupiter uh, that suggests that the uh, the the uh, rotation axis of Jupiter has changed, and that's um, probably because of the the the, the way the um, planet rotates about Jupiter. Uh, you 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 expect. Um, you, yes, it's because there's a misalignment of the rotation axis with Jupiter, even though it's tidally locked. You've got this misalignment. Sorry, I'm I'm finding trying to find the right words to describe it. So the direction to Jupiter is different from what you'd expect given the rotation axis that that Ganymede shows. Um, I, so when you think about it, you know the the way our moon rotates, it goes around once per lunation, once every time it revolves around the planet. And its its rotation axis is almost perpendicular to its orbit, but Ganymede isn't. That's the that's the bottom line. Okay, right. Um, uh, if you'd ask an Australian scientist what it was, they would have said, "Oh, it's out of whack." <laughs> um, yeah, well, they might also say, "Well, everything's gone bung. Everything's gone bung. It's out of whack." Yeah, yeah. that's what it was. Mm. Yeah. All right. So, uh, yeah, fascinating history and uh, one big collision. Uh, wouldn't you have loved to have been able to film that and put it on Instagram? You would. Uh, this, yeah. oh, yes, and, and you can find that story on Cosmos Magazine's website. This is Space Nuts with Andrew Dunkley and Professor Fred Watson. Zero G and I feel fine. Space Nuts. Just going to take some medicine, Fred, so this medicine here. Hang on. Let me look. <laughs> uh, let me see it again. Oh, oh, that's interesting looking medicine. Yeah. Yes, it is. It's um, it's called Malot. <laughs> no. Um, could be something similar. All right. Uh, let's move on. <laughs> and uh, we'll talk. We we'll talk now about uh, black hole jets. Now we've done a story about them only very recently. Uh, but it's back in the news. There's more to be told about these black hole jets. And this is something we get questions about so very often, Fred. We do, because it's kind of counterintuitive. Yeah, you've got a black hole uh, from which you know nothing can escape because it's a black hole. And yet it has around it a swirling disk of material, which itself is propelling jets of plasma to the north and south of the black hole, in other words, perpendicular to this disk of material. Uh, and um, we glibly say that's due to the magnetic field of the black hole. Um, um, rotating black holes do have ma magnetic fields. Um, but the details of that, I think, have been, well, largely theoretical until now, when scientists at uh, the PPPL which is the Princeton Plasma Physics Laboratory in New Jersey, uh, they've actually done it. They've created a black hole, not quite, uh, but uh, created the, the, the plasma that would come from the material surrounding a black hole. So it's a yeah. high energy density plasma. Uh, they did it by shooting uh, a very, very powerful pulsed laser at a plastic target. Uh, so that creates the plasma, and they, you know, they created um, basically nuclear fusion in a in a little fuel capsule, uh, and got from that protons and X-rays, all the stuff that uh, that they think would be in this disk of material rotating uh, around a black hole. Uh, but what happens is the way the X-rays and the streams of protons. Uh, interfere with the high energy density plasma or, or uh, the way they interact with it um, involves very, very strong magnetic fields, which do the sort of thing that magnetic fields do on the sun. They, they break and recombine. Uh, mm. And what they've done uh, is essentially seen how you can create 
a, a, a straight, narrow line of plasma. Um, I'm going to read some uh, some comments by one of the researchers, Will Fox, uh, at PPPL. Uh, Our experiment was unique because we could directly see the magnetic field changing over time. We could directly observe how the field gets pushed out and responds to the plasma in a type of tug of war. Um, and, and, and another comment from one of the other researchers, um, when we did the experiment and analyzed the data, we discovered we had something big, observing magneto rayleigh taylor instabilities arising from the interaction of plasma and magnetic field had long been thought to occur, but had never been directly observed until now. Uh, this observation helps to confirm that this instability occurs when expanding plasma meets magnetic fields. So uh, the gobbledygook word there is uh, magneto rayleigh Taylor instability. Uh, it's described very nicely by space.com uh, as a bubbling and frothing of the plasma. Uh, it sloshes against the magnetic field lines, bubbles and froths, and gives you this instability. It creates shapes in the magnetic field that looks like that look like whirls and mushrooms. But this is the, the tricky bit here, Andrew. As mm. that energy decreases, um, then like they do on the sun, the magnetic field lines could snap back rather than creating this froth of magnetism. And when they do that, uh, you get a compression of the plasma into this jet of, of material, just like we see coming from black holes in the centers of galaxies. So an experiment that basically duplicates what happens uh, in, in the plasma surrounding a black hole. Remarkable stuff. And you need a high energy physics laboratory to do it. It's not the sort of thing you can do in your backyard. And 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 we've finally found a good reason to have plastic, which is you know even yes, better to to zap it with a, a twenty joule laser. That's right. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, we need to do a lot of that. Um, so as I understand it, this has basically opened the door to improve our understanding of what's happening in space in terms of these kinds of events because. Um, it's always been very mysterious, but they've created it in a lab, which is, which is extraordinary on its own. But now it opens the door to wider study and understanding. Is that fairly accurate? Yeah, that's right. So what they've done, uh, I mean, the you know, the best modeling that we've got with all the supercomputers doing calculations, theoretical calculations of what you expect to find in the region around a black hole, um, you can model it till the blue in your face, till you're blue in the face. But um, if you can demonstrate it experimentally. And there aren't many circumstances in astronomy where we can do that because you can't, for example, build planets and watch how they distort the space around them. They're Not just really. too big. Not really, no. But you can. Uh, what you can do with some, uh, in, uh, you know, some uh, interactions that involve high energies, and this is clearly one of those, uh, is to build clever experiments. This, there was some quite nuanced uh, ways in which this experiment was carried out. Uh, if you can do that and show that what you get at the end of it is what you expected to get from the theory, then you can be much more confident in applying the theory to a real situation where you've got a black hole in the center of a galaxy. Uh, so it's very valuable stuff. And in fact, you can probably learn more from it because the, the reality of doing this with your streaming um, relativistic plasma uh, that might teach you other things that your theory wasn't really um, wasn't sufficiently finely tuned to to show. So very valuable experimentation and a great result. Yes, indeed. Uh, if you'd like to read up on that, uh, as Fred said, it's at space.com, or you can read the paper uh, in the uh, journal Physical Review Research. This is Space Nuts. Andrew Dunkley here. Fred Watson there. Space nuts. And we've got one more story, Fred, and this one is going to get people really kind of, well, maybe divided. Um, there are people in the world that believe that uh, aliens have visited Earth, and there are those that say poppycock. Uh, and now they've been looking into these thoughts and claims and beliefs, and it's starting to become a problem. Why so? Uh, because, yes, because the what it does is it breeds conspiracy theories, 
uh, because on the one hand, you've got uh, you know the Pentagon and others saying nothing to see here, and they're being far more explicit in the way they're saying that now because we're seeing pictures of of what they have seen. Uh, no, but you know, they're seeing unidentified anomalous phenomena, but no evidence in any of that that these are due to extraterrestrial uh, visitations. So yep. you've got on the one hand Pentagon saying that nothing to see here, uh, and there. Are, large numbers of people saying, well, we don't believe the Pentagon because they're always keeping secrets. So they must be there. Uh, and so there was a poll done in 2019. This is just one of the statistics that I think is really interesting about this story. Uh, a poll done in 19, 2019, a Gallup poll, uh, found that 68% of Americans believe that the US government knows more about UFOs than it is telling. Uh, and the you know this this that's one reason I think why there's been much more openness uh, about the Pentagon files about this sort of thing than there has been in the past. We've talked about this before that uh, the, there was a congressional hearing uh, not very long ago uh, about these you know these documents. Um, it's it, it's really you know it's it's really that that idea of conspiracy. That is probably the most dangerous thing because the more people you've got who believe in conspiracies, the fewer people you've got who are, you know, taking a more um, a, a more uh, how can I say measured line about mm. things that we don't understand. Um, the, the bottom line is, and you know, I can say this as a, a well semi-working astrophysicist. I don't do much research these days, but I'm still very connected with the with the field. There is zero evidence zero evidence of any visitation uh, by um, by aliens to our planet. There is nothing you can present that conclusively proves that. And yet we've got this huge number uh, that thinks that something's going on at Roswell, for example, uh, the government oh, yes. keeps from us, all of that's in the mix. Oh, there is there is proof that aliens have not visited Earth, and that's it's called the Drake Equation. Well, the, yes, that, that's right. The Fermi paradox as well. You know, yeah. the, the, the Fermi paradox says, where are they all? Uh, because we should yeah. be seeing them, but they're not here. Yeah. So, I, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I'm just looking at some of the statistics. 24% uh, of Americans say they've seen a UFO. I'm sure it's similar in other countries. Um, well, you can't absolutely say that people have not seen UFOs. That doesn't mean they're alien spacecraft. It could just be a, a jet plane that nobody identified or the sun's hitting it at a strange angle so it looks like a blob instead of a metal fuselage. There's all sorts of... You know, most of them can be explained away. Uh, yeah, that's right. Most, most of them are the planet Venus, in fact. Uh, yes, uh, yeah. yes. Absolutely. We, yeah, yeah. Lots of people post um, questions on social media. Oh, what was that big light in the sky last night? Yeah, it was Venus. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, I it, think the other... The, sorry, go ahead, Andrew. Go I'm ahead. just thinking this is not going to go away because once people get a bee in their bonnet, they don't want to let it go. That's correct. Uh, and there's, there's even a concern uh, that, you know, there might be... Uh, a, an, an invasion of the Roswell site, a bit like there was on the Capitol on mm. the 6th of January. Uh, that's something that has authorities worried, I think, uh, that that could happen. Um, it's also this, this article, and it, it's actually, uh, it's basically um, uh, an article from The Conversation. It's written by Tony Milligan, who is a research fellow in the philosophy of ethics at King's College in London. Um, the, there, there is one of the other elements in this article, which is a really interesting one, is the way that in popular um, ideas, popular conspiracies, a lot of First Nations people are being incorporated into those uh, ideas that you've got First Nations communities who know a lot more about uh, UFOs and things of that sort than we do. There's there's a sort of mix in here, and I think that side of it is one that's concerning as well because First Nations people across the world, including here in Australia and Canada in the United States, have got creation stories which are 
fabulous and wonderful to listen to and wonderful to align with our understanding of what's going on in the sky and how it works from a scientific yeah. point of view. I, I think this really started taking off uh, after World War II, but in particular in the 60s and, and then into the 70s, and there was a, a really well-made, whether or not it was full of shite or you know, based on some truths, uh, documentary called Chariots of the Gods. And yes, that's right. Yep. Yep. I think it busted the whole thing open, to be honest. The Chariots of the Gods was uh, about the Nazca lines and the Nazca figures. Yes. Um, yeah. And uh, yes, it's complete fiction. Um, you know, because it, certainly in the case of the Nazca lines, you can, there's still the, the pegs that those um, early Peruvians used to, to draw them and bits of string that they used to make the alignments, they're still there. Yeah. And you can carbon date them because they're organic material. Um, that was back in the 60s, you're quite right. Uh, it certainly gave us a lot of interest in in that uh, in that thinking. Um, I visited the Nazca lines and talked to uh, people who are archaeologists in that country, uh, specialising in them. Um, there's a, a good reason why those lines were drawn and why those figures were drawn, gigantic figures in the desert. Hmm. Uh, and that's because they believed that the shamans, the holy men, uh, and they nearly all were men, were able to fly above them and see these things on the ground. That's that's basically the, the bottom line why it was. And some of them also mark out what you might call processional tracks. You, there are things that you could walk along. So there's a hummingbird that uh, is is a beautiful thing in the, on the desert floor, uh, which has a, an, an entry and an exit. So people could walk along in, in their whatever their rituals were that they were doing, they followed the path of the honey, hummingbird and came out. So mm -hmm. that there's a lot of study being done on those lines. Um, but yes, yeah, the think, chariots of the gods kicked it all yeah. off in the 60s. Oh, for sure. Yeah, that, that hummingbird, I think people who do that walk, they uh, they come out just below the back of the wings, um, behind the legs. That's where the exit is. Right. I, I think there is an exit there. Yes, I believe that's <laughs> right. Yes. I'm sure there is. I'm sure there is, but uh, yeah, I mean, when you've got uh, presidents and high-profile politicians talking about releasing information about what the uh, Pentagon knows and what the US government knows about these kinds of things, it just stirs the pot, doesn't it? It just goes on and on and on. Yes, that's right. It, it, yeah. it's, so the, the more open you can be, the, the the less likely you are to get conspiracy theories, but there might be, you know, the, 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 the still might happen whether you're open or not. It's the bottom line. Uh, Think we're way too far down the track for this yeah, to be sounds like it, doesn't it? brought under control. To be perfectly honest, yeah. But it's a fascinating story. Really, a really good read. Uh, you can find that uh, at now. Where was it? Um, Fizz dot org. Yeah, uh, it's it is indeed on Fizz dot org, but it's also on the conversation. That's where yeah, conversations uh, got yeah. a great article on it as well. Check them out. Uh, that brings us to the end. Don't forget to visit us online if you uh, so desire and um, check us out. You can send questions through the AMA link or you can read the Astronomy Daily News feed and sign up for that. You can go to our shop and see what's on offer, all sorts of uh, space nuts, bits and pieces. And you can also support us through the support space nuts button if you would like to do that. And if you do follow us on uh, any social media platforms, please don't forget to uh, like us, follow us, or subscribe, depending on which platform it is. Fred, we're all done. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, it's a pleasure. Uh, always very good to talk about all the stuff that we talk about. <laughs> yes, yes. I'm sure some of these stories will spawn questions. I have no doubt about that, which we'll answer in later episodes. Thanks, Fred. We'll see you soon. Sounds good. Thank you. Fred Watson, astronomer at large, and Hugh in the studio, who's been uh, incredibly quiet today, very, very quiet, which is quite normal. And from me, Andrew Dunkley, thanks for your company. We'll see you on the very next episode of Space Nuts. Bye-bye. Space Nuts. You'll be listening to the Space Nuts podcast. Available at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or your favourite podcast player. You can also stream on demand at Bytes.com. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com.